Okay. So I'd just like to uh, welcome everybody to Software Design and Development 2 or CSCI 2120. So this is a continuation of 1583, which was Software Design and Development 1. So uh, conceptually, if you're in this class, then you pass the other class. And just like the prior class, you have to be concurrently registered in the lab sequence. Uh, so pretty much the same rules. I don't think they allow you to take these classes uh, without you know, being properly registered or whatnot, but just make sure that you're signed up for both 2120 and 2121. So with that said, uh, this is actually my first time I get to, to teach this class. And so I was going over the material and I think I do wanna do a bit of refactoring over the way it's been uh, uh, taught before. So you, uh, we, we might have a, a, a fun learning experience on both sides where you're learning the content and I'm learning how I wanna deliver the content. So uh, with that said, I'll probably keep things in flux and uh, I could potentially change anything at, at my discretion, but don't be concerned or worried because I will be working alongside with you in that regard. But I definitely like to be a little bit more experimental with my uh, pedagogical approach when it comes to tinkering with the uh, with the way the material is taught, so that you it's delivered in a way that is uh, primes you for being ready at a uh, industry or professional level. So uh, one thing that I really like about the way that we do fifteen eighty three is that we teach you how to touch all of the uh, technologies from the command line. Right, so you get a decent understanding of how to use your terminal uh, in a POSIX compliant environment. So, you know, you can use LS or CD or, or what have you to be able to navigate your directory structure, be able to kind of uh, uh, execute software without having to navigate through the graphic user interface without having to depend on an event-driven environment to go ahead and do that. Uh, in 2120, one thing that I would like to try to introduce this, uh, this semester would be uh, an IDE, an integrated developer environment, and start to teach you some of the more complex concepts but in a environment that would be used at a professional level. So like with IntelliJ or with Eclipse or with NetBeans. And with that said, I think I'm going to probably adopt IntelliJ for this uh, semester. So we might deviate a little bit differently than, when, than either the prior classes or even what the lab might do. Uh, Cause I haven't had a chance to touch space with the lab instructor yet. So I do know because of the way that I might tinker with the content, I might fall out of uh, sequence with the lab, but don't stress out. <laughs> uh, I'll keep all that in mind. Okay, so let me go through the syllabus first and foremost, and then we can have a little class discussion um, in terms of where everyone's at and what the expectations are uh, for our first day. That way we can kind of get to know each other, especially since this is a relatively small class. We only have 15 uh, students in it. So it makes it really easy to be able to kind of address everyone uh, with inside of the um, inside of the uh, lecture time. So I'll start with introductions. I'm Ted Holmberg. I have an office on campus. So if you find yourself on campus, my office number is Math three four seven, right? You can contact me in several different ways. Uh, I have an email address, right, which is on the syllabus. Uh, this is, uh, you You clearly found my Zoom channel, right? Because you're, you're on there if you're watching this. Uh, the preferred way that I uh, would like for students to contact me is through our Discord server. So there's a link if you're not already a member of that server, you should join that because that's where I'll go ahead and effectively do my office hours. Uh, I don't put a times for my office hours because you'll see because we use Discord, you can just ask a question at any time and I can go ahead and uh, answer at any time. So I have really strange hours. Uh, 
I think most people in computer science do. So just, you know, hit me up on Discord at any time and uh, at any hour. And uh, if I'm asleep or if I'm not available, I'll try to answer at my earliest convenience. Now, with that said, we do have live video lectures right through Zoom. Uh, they run from Monday through Thursday between 11 to 12.15. So, so six hours of lecture a week. This course is going to fly by. So typically, just, just to frame this, a typical course over the fall or spring semester goes 16 weeks and you have three hours of lecture per week. So the summer schedules effectively doubled that. So it's, if, you, if you look at it, it's eight weeks of summer lectures, but instead of three hours, it's six hours of lecture. So super accelerated pace. So this one class, even though it's three credit hours, you should think of it as the equivalent of six credit hours of actual work, because that's how it would be in a fall or spring uh, semester. Of course, you already know the prereqs and co-reqs. The department does a pretty good job at that. Okay, so here, this is part of the old uh, syllabus that I kind of copy and paste it from Suma's old syllabus. Uh, but I might reorder some of the content of this and I might drop some of this and add other things in there. I've already added some things in there that's not in your version. So let me go over the kind of learning objectives that we're gonna go with, um, with 2120. So before, before I go into what we're going to learn over the course of this semester, let me preface as to what the expectation was with 1583. So 1583, you might have had a, uh, you can have multiple students with a diverse set of programming skills, right? So commonly what happens in 1583, at least from my experiences teaching the class, is you have some students who have never programmed before. In fact, many of the students, most of our students have never actually uh, started developing code until they are in that class. And then there are other students who have been programming either in high school or they have been programming in their free time. And so they're, they're pretty well seasoned in the basics uh, by the time they hit the intro sequence. So, so 1583 is all about getting everyone to the same plane, to the same level. So over the course of last semester, you kind of are slowly nuanced, right? There's a some zero knowledge, expectation of uh, some zero knowledge of programming, and it builds everyone up to the point where you know how to build a basic object-oriented system. So now that there's the expectation that everyone knows how to build software kind of in isolation uh, of, of a team, the second class is gonna start looking at more advanced concepts that are driven from what we learned in the first class. And to do so in an environment that facilitates how to build code, not just how to build code, but how to build code alongside other people. So how do you build code in such a way that you can share it across team members, which is what you'd have to do in industry, right? And so we're gonna continue this concept of object-oriented design, because again, object-oriented design allows complex architectures to be split into these isolated components and then the task of building these components can be split amongst team members so this has just been a very effective uh design uh approach to be able to build out software across teams and to build very complex systems but to break them down to be uh very simple and very testable and very maintainable all very important critical concepts when developing software that you intend to deploy and and actually have users use we'll talk about some software engineering principles so again we're going to try to level up your uh concepts on how to design software so again the key words here is uh, both software design and software development. So for the design portions, we'll learn a little bit more about programming by contract and what that means. Uh, we're gonna learn how to start doing some software testing 
and we'll take a look at different testing, uh, different approaches to implementation. So there's a very common approach in industry that's called test-driven development that we're going to take a look at. Um, so let's see, I have a question. Will we need the textbook? Well, we are going to be using uh, as the text, uh, well, loosely based, the text is, uh, is Ditel and Ditel's How to Program the Late Objects Edition. It's the same textbook that 1583 uses. And uh, conceptually, we would be using the second half of this textbook. This is a good textbook. Uh, I do like this textbook a lot. I think it does a great job of giving examples and explaining in, uh, large, in, in great detail with lots of verbosity uh, what is going on at every level of the code. So I do recommend that you get this book. Now, I'm not going to adhere to following this book exactly. Uh, but the thing is, when one goes to do a deep dive in a programming language, all the concepts that we'll cover are going to be covered inside the textbook. So uh, the textbook is a good resource to have. It's not your only resource. And uh, one of the difficulties about computer science is the fact that a lot of the programming languages that we use in the classroom, they evolve over time. And so textbooks don't evolve as quickly as our programming languages do. Uh, and to give you an example of this, I wanna say that this textbook, uh, this was the 11th edition. Let's see when it was published really quick. Show me this. Okay, so this is what, the, I'm gonna just grab it from here. Grab that, let's paste this in. Let's see, when was this published? Because I want to say this was a couple years ago now. No, why did it? Oh, I didn't want to go to Amazon. <laughs> oh. Okay, let's see. Let's go to Pearson. That's where I want to go, the actual publisher of this. Okay, so this is 2018, right? So let's think about this. The most recent up to date version of this textbook is published in 2018. We're currently in 2022, right? So that's that's several years now. Like, and and, and to put this to put this uh, more precisely, Java is maintained by Oracle, and they have Java releases on a six month schedule. So I want to say as of today let's check check i want to say we're at up to java 17. let's see when java 17 was released let's go here let's check our release set. yeah you'll see that under the there's a 16 a six month release schedule so uh, uh so java 17 was released let's see what was our release date on that i want to say it was just recently Why don't you put, oh, here we go. So as of September of 2021, Java 17 was released. Oh, so we might be at Java 18 now. Let's, let's check Java 18. Okay, so let's go here. But Java 17 is gonna be your LTS. So Java 18 is out, but usually you have two releases uh, you have two types of releases in just the software world in general, right? You have what's called the LTS. That's your, uh, that's essentially going to be your long-term service releases. So that's going to see support for many years. And those are the ones you typically adopt because it has, uh, it's, the, it's the basis by which uh, you know you will have support. And then you have these intermediary releases, like Java 18 is out, but it's not an LTS release. So everything that's going to be mission critical software is going to rely on the LTS releases. So we can think of the big, the, the main version of Java that's current right now, even though 18 is out, will be 17, because that's our LTS. Okay, so why am I showing you the versions of Java? Well, one problem that I have with textbooks is the fact that they get published like every five years. And a programming language is 
constantly improving and evolving in the span of months, right? By the time I'm done teaching this class, the language will have changed somewhat. So textbooks in terms of learning a programming language aren't ideal for keeping up with everything that the language can do. They don't capture everything because what this textbook captures is something that is now five years into the past. Like look at what it's, it's advertising. It's the old version of Java 8, which was an LTS of five years ago. And since then it was Java 11 and now it's Java 17. So this, this textbook is actually three LTS versions behind on Java. And so it's still of great value because it goes over the things that don't change in programming languages, but the, the language itself improves and allows and affords newer and greater and cooler things that you don't get cap that are captured if we strictly rely on a textbook. Does that make sense? Good question, by the way. Uh, so, so I will use the textbook because does everyone get the textbook for free? Do, doesn't the university charge and you get the textbook as part of your, uh, as part of your like fees? Yeah. Yeah, so it's worth having access to it. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so yes. You should have access to the textbook, uh, and the uh, this class is built around concepts that go into the textbook. But I'll also use principles that might not be covered in the textbook simply because the textbook was published in 2018. But that's just that's one of the problems with textbooks, right? Like they're not published at the speed that uh, technology progresses at, especially inside of the IT domain. But this is an important lesson for us all, anyway. When you go into industry. The languages, the frameworks, the technologies and tooling you're going to use changes constantly. So you've selected a domain where you will be a constant student learning new technologies. And so it's just it's a never ending cycle of just learning new things, which is both rewarding uh, and it can sometimes be stressful. OK, now, with that said, uh, one of my recommendations for where one should go uh, is the actual uh, API documentation pages. So uh, if, it, if it was left to me, I would just use uh, the documentation pages to try to teach these classes. But one thing that a lot of times these documentation pages don't teach are some of the, um, the academic concepts behind software engineering principles. So having the combination of the two, I think, is really good. We can rely on the textbook for the academic component that goes into software engineering principles. And then we can rely on the Oracle documentation pages for relying on the most up-to-date specifications on how we can use Java. OK, so we're going to continue this concept of object-oriented design. And so we're going to come back to this uh, later on in our, our lecture today, because I just want to get a feel for where everyone's at. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about pro programming by contract. Uh, you probably already know what that is a little bit, but it might not have been formally defined. And that's going to be more or less just one of these concepts that are governed by software engineering principles. We'll learn what software testing is and uh, test-driven development. We're going to learn about uh, files and streams and object serialization. Uh, so effectively up to this point, so I guess let me break it down line by line here. So software testing and uh, test-driven development. So up to this point, let me ask you, how have you, oh, well, let me, I guess this is a good opportunity. When I go through my learning objectives, I can just query where you're at with each of these. So when I say object-oriented design, probably what you covered in 1583 was you learned about how to build the classes and that a class is kind of like a blueprint that allows you to instantiate an instance, right? And so you can build a software project as a collection of 
instances, all defined by classes. And so it allows you to take these really complex concepts and break them down into these actual software objects. So you're, you're developing everything with a, a concept that is being modeled as this software entity, this object that fits together and can cross communicates, right? And then you can keep building on top of this concept with more and more complexity where it gets more and more involved in the way that you can start uh, generalizing these things, but still being able to test them. So at this point, how far, and we'll talk about this a little bit more because I actually, I, I brought my 1583. So we can talk about all the learning objectives there and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of query you with how you feel about each of those things. So I'll circle back around here at the tail end of uh, this lecture. But so let's jump here to pro programming by contract. Um, let's see here. I guess one way that you can think about this is everyone had done the lab in 1581, right? So what was one of the necessary components you had to do in those labs? Predominantly, there was an auto lab that you were submitting to, and there was some expected output based off of some expected input. And if you process the input into the desired output, right, then you got your points for that lab. Did everyone have a lab experience like that? Did everyone use auto lab? Okay, perfect. So effectively what you were doing, whether you knew that was the name or not, was effectively programming by contract. You and Autolab had a contract. The contract was, if given this input, I will produce this output, right? And if you fulfill that contract, you got the points. And if you didn't fulfill that contract, you didn't get the points. So you have some experience, you have a notional experience of programming by contract because you were doing it you probably just weren't told that's what you were doing. But effectively, that's how real development works. There's a set of expectations of what kind of output based on. So you create a well-defined specification that says, given this input, I'll produce this output. And all software is designed with this concept of message passing. So we're going to delve a little bit deeper in how that permeates throughout our software design process. But you got to experience it in terms of a testability, which is going to bring us back to this next thing where we're going to talk about software testing and test driven development. Again, Autolab is kind of exposing you to a world of test driven development such that the lab instructor was kind of like the, the, uh, the senior level developer and they were giving you specification reports and then you were abiding by that. You were designing your lab in such a way that it would pass the test given inside of your instructions. So that is test-driven development. We're gonna go into much greater detail, but I'm just trying to give everyone a notional idea of what we'll cover. So you, you, you have a little bit of experience here through Autolab, you have a little bit of experience of test-driven development because that's how you were prompted to design your code or to develop your code inside of the labs and use a sense of software testing. Now, the type of software testing that you were doing in Autolab is what's called functional testing, where you're just testing the overall output of your code. We're gonna look at another approach of testing our code over the course of this semester, one that's used in industry as well, which is gonna be called unit testing. And then we're gonna compare and contrast between unit testing and functional testing. So you're familiar with one type of testing because that's how you got your grades. And so we'll, we'll learn how to use another approach. Okay, let's talk about streams. Everyone's already seen a basic version of streams, right? Did you talk about byte streams at all? Did anyone, was there an idea? Did your lecturers talk about streams at all in Java 1 in 1583? Who did everyone have for your instructor, by the way? Okay, so even so, even if 
even if it wasn't explicitly stated in your class, you have touch streams, whether you realize it or not. So we're gonna open up the box on streams more than what you have exposure to. So, and what I mean by that, let me be very explicit here. The streams that you likely touched are system.in and system.out. So those are predefined streams that the JVM, that Java uses to be able to send data out of your application, right? Or to be able to import data into your application. And so since those are predefined, and one of the great things about Java is it's a general purpose language that allows you to have it be extensible, someone else had defined those streams and we were able to make use of them in 1583, right? So it allowed you to just do system.out.print and then you could, you could take data from your application and put that into the output stream. Or you can go ahead and use your scanner object, right? Instantiates a scanner object on system.in, the input stream, and you could start taking tokens off and translating those tokens into data types, such as strings or ints or doubles, right? So you have a little bit of familiarity with streams at a very basic level. Well, this class is going to look to expand that. Can we define our own streams? Can we use these streams other than system.in, system.out? Why would we need to do this? Well, think about how software you've built so far is. So far, the software you've built is command line, right? So I, I want you to think about what a modern day application looks like. The purpose of this class is to bring you from where you're currently at, where you probably design command line applications that run on one machine and that takes in user input and produces output, but that's pretty much it, right? So it's a, you learned how to build applications, but they're relatively basic applications and they, they don't reflect modern sensibilities of how real software looks in the professional world. The entire point of this class is to take you from where you're currently at and being able to actually build real life, real world software. So that means the testing tools, which we've talked about already, but that also means learning how to use these streams and files. Probably up to this point, you haven't learned how to save your data onto files so that every time you restart your application, you are starting from scratch. You can't re, you can't import a prior state of the application. So think about something like a video game or like a Word document editor or like a tax program where you can save your data and then and then reload it, re-import it into the application. Well, that is done with this concept of being able to use streams to import data into our application to export it back out. So far, all of the data management you've done has been in memory management, but there's an ability for us to be able to save that data. And when we talk about things like object serialization, that's what object serialization is talking about. So these two bullet points are kind of related to one another. Once we, object serialization is taking in memory data that we have in our application and defining it in a way that we can store it into a file and then import it, load it back up and make it in memory again. So this allows us to actually close our application and relaunch our application and reload the prior state in between executions, which is super important in modern day uh, applications. So we'll learn how to actually do file reading and file management inside of Java. We'll learn how to do that with streams and we'll learn how to do that to actually preserve the state of our data in our applications. Okay, so let me jump down to another thing then. I'm gonna kind of jump around here. So besides reading files and uh, writing files and being able to serialize and deserialize our data, another big thing that we probably didn't see in 1583 is a concept that's called event-driven programming. And so you can't do graphic user interfaces without event-driven programming. And so likely all of the 
um, interfaces that you designed in 1583 were command driven, right? And so typically a command driven architecture, a command driven interface system is text-based. So you probably were interfacing by issuing a command to your application and then it would execute it and then you could issue another command. But in modern interfaces, usually there's a button or there's a text field and you can click on the text field and then that, that, that puts a focus on it so that you could type in some, some word, for instance, like let's say the text field is a name field, you would type in your name and then you would hit a submit button which would cause the system to go ahead and import that data from the text field into the application. So we're gonna learn how we can define a graphic user interface and how we can set up events for our, our system to respond, to be able to import and respond to those actions. So it's a whole nother way, a whole nother approach in designing a way to interface with our end users but one that's modern, one that we're currently using. Um, I don't know why streams got defined here twice. Let me remove that. Okay. So, uh, so when we start talking about uh, GUIs and event-driven systems, we can start talking about uh, threads as well or multi-threaded. So right now, all of your applications are running on a single thread. And so that's, that's really basic, but there are, are reasons why we might need to have an application that can spawn multiple threads. And typically the two classical examples of this is for GUI programming or for networking. And so what a thread is, is it's where you can go ahead and have your application. So right now, Let's see here, let me change this. So it's not just multi-threading, but it also says concurrency. Okay, so right now, there's no sense of concurrency in your application. What you probably learned is that when your algorithm executes, it's, on a, it's, it's done in a sequence, right? It's a sequentially based, which means that if I had an application that was 10 lines of code. Uh, let me see if I can't, well, I wish I had some source code that I had prompted, but if I had like system.out.print, hello, and then system.out.print uh, system uh, world, and then I had an if statement, right? It's gonna execute those in order. And so what concurrency allows us to do is actually start executing code alongside one another. Because what happens is when, when you're executing without concurrency, you have this concept of blocking, which means that, and you've probably seen this with a, with a while, right? Uh, let's do this. Let's, let's, let's build some code really quick. So we can have a, a practical example. Uh, okay, let's see here. Let's uh, go to my desktop. Let's create a directory. Let's, what do I want to call this? It's CSCI 2120. Uh, okay, let's change into that directory. Okay, and let me do this. Let's touch a... What do I want to call this? Um, blocking. Nope, I should spell it correctly. Blocking.java. Okay, let's go to where that's at. Let's go here, the finder window. <sighs> let's see, desktop. Okay, let's open this with, so right now we'll just use Visual Studio Code. Okay, so let's do this. Let's make a quick example. So the public class blocking public static void main string array of args. Okay, so let's do this. Let's say we have 
do a system dot out so system dot out dot print so let's do point f okay before the loop okay system dot out dot print let's do print f after the loop okay perfect and now let's do a for loop and i starts at zero i is i don't know let's see how long do you think it would take to do a million iterations i plus plus okay there we go uh, we're not going to do we're not going to do any printouts there. <laughs> oh, we'll do this. System dot. Oh, let's do an if statement. If uh, we'll just do the for loop. Okay. Let's go here. Let's compile and let's run that. Okay. Uh, okay, that was clearly not enough times. So let's do this. Let's add another zero in there. And let's just do uh, save that. And let's do this. Let's actually put an instruction in there. Let's do, okay. Uh, let's do and x is equal to zero. Let's do x times, uh, let's say 10. Uh, okay, clearly I've been programming in JavaScript a little bit too long for my semicolons. Oops, can't have that separated. Okay. The problem with switching between languages. Okay. Okay, so we have before, after. Let's also put some new line characters in here. Okay, so let's see here. So now we're doing okay so we have let's see here let's do this for 10 million times actually yeah, that looks fine okay okay that's getting a little bit better let's do that again okay and there we go. Uh, oh. Okay, finally hit a number big enough so that I didn't get a instant result. Okay, the entire point of me fiddling around with code for the last five minutes was to try to illustrate what blocking is inside of an algorithm, right? So in this instance, notice I'm at before the loop, right? But why am I not printing out after the loop like I was doing before? And well, clearly before, after the loop will print, I have to finish the execution of this for loop, which is running an insanely number of iterations like it probably will never complete i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to cancel the problem it just makes a number so large to illustrate the entire concept of what motivates concurrency in programming so there are instances where you have to pause at a time in your application but you don't want the rest of your application to pause that's when we're really going to care about uh concurrency 
typically I said it's with networking and it's for GUI things because GUI things, usually you're waiting for an event from the user, but you might still want to process data in the background and you don't want to just be waiting until a user causes a button click to occur. So you're listening to your GUI on a, another thread. You spawn a separate thread that's just designed for managing the GUI things. And then that interacts with an application that's running concurrent to your GUI that's actually doing the processing of your application or for networking. The amount of time it takes to send a request to a server and then to get their server response could take seconds, it could take minutes and you don't want your application to necessarily pause and stop processing data between that time. Like imagine if you were playing a video game and your character stopped and didn't move until it got its new set of coordinates from the server. That would not be a good experience, uh, a good uh, user experience. So modern day software makes use of event-driven programming or concurrency. They both kind of solve similar problems. Okay, let me kill this. Does, does that make sense? Was this, did this example help kind of distinguish what the distinction between concurrency and uh, uh, or multi-threading versus a single threaded application. And again, this is just a, we're just covering the syllabus and so we'll definitely go into this in more context, but I'm, I'm just trying to give you a idea of where we're gonna go over the course of the semester. Okay, so again, to drive these points about concurrency and multi-threading, we're gonna look at it from the scope of basic networking. So how, can you build an application that can network across another machine to another application? How can they share data between each other? And we'll, uh, let's see, and also how it relates to GUIs. So in addition to that, we'll look at some advanced types. So we learned in Java 1 that there were primitive data types and then that were there were reference data types. And so with the reference data types that allowed us to start defining our own classes where we can build our own data types, where we can have our own objects that we could store into memory. And we're going to take and look at an advanced version of that, which is going to be generics, where we can even have uh, uh, container classes like arrays, and we can go ahead and define generic types that they expect. So one of the big things that Java provides to us that other languages might not provide is uh, is strongly typed. So was, was was that concept was the idea of a strongly typed language uh, defined in 1583? Was that a concept that was articulated? Well, if it wasn't, just means that in order, whenever we declare a variable, we also have to declare what data type it is. And it's because one of the most powerful concepts for Java, one reason why Java is so heavily used in industry is because it's got a compilation step. And then there's actually an interpretation. Uh, it, it's both an interpreted language and a compiled language. And so this allows for a significant amount of testability to be applied towards your code. And it's always best to try to identify issues during the compilation step as opposed to the execution step because you get less feedback. It's harder to find your edge cases. It's harder to identify what is making your program run in like an erroneous or strange way. And so because of the compilation step, right, when you go, and again, what you've probably experienced is by working for the command line, you're probably typing in Java C for the, the JDK or Java for the JRE. So when you go to compile your uh, Java files or source code into object code, into byte code, uh, then if it can't compile it, it will issue an error. Well, that's when you want to get your errors, right? That's when you can know when something is not well defined and could potentially cause an edge case to happen inside of your software. So strongly typed languages means by specifying what data type 
is being used as a parameter or as a variable at any given time, it gives increased testability of your code, which means it's more likely to be error free. And at the end of the day, when you're working on large coding projects that span hundreds of thousands of lines of code that can span millions of lines of code, and where you might have thousands of developers contributing to that code base, the ability to test to make sure that it, the changes that you're going to add into this larger ecosystem of code doesn't like create a domino effect or a butterfly effect and bring the entire system down when you deploy that change, that's super critical. And so that's what that's what uh, the the a strongly typed language affords us. And so in order to be able to maintain that strongly typed concept, we're going to learn about generics and we'll learn about uh, basic data structures. So and then th this will be a good primer for you as we go into uh, as, as we'll leverage that into data structures. So the class that follows this one in the sequence is uh, 2125. And so we'll start to cover some of the basic concepts of data structures. I want to I want to look at the predefined classes inside Java and make use as of as much of the language as possible. So I want you to learn how networking works. I want you to learn how event driven programming works and how we can start building uh, graphic user interfaces. I want you to learn what are the design patterns that we have to make use of in order to make networked event-driven GUI interfaces uh, and how to be able to take advantage of all of the testing hardness and the tooling that the professionals use. I wanna learn how to be able to import data from files and to export data into files. And then I wanna learn how to decide what to put our data into, what data structures should we make use of when we're designing our applications. And so right now you've probably looked at uh, array list, right? So when you covered list, let me go over here to the 1583 syllabus. When we were covering, uh, let's see, when we were covering your arrays, did you, did you go into array list quite deeply? What did you do with array list? Did everyone? Okay, so we'll take a, a deeper look at array list and we're gonna compare and contrast array list to another type of list that's predefined into Java, in, in Java, which is called a linked list. And, and uh, there's, actually, there's actually considerations on whether you should use an array list or linked list. And again, these are concepts that we'll go into. Uh, and then we'll learn some other data structures as well. We'll learn a little bit about queues and stacks uh, which are built on top of list. We'll learn about other ways we can model uh, a data. So if we adapt the link list, we can easily turn into a tree structure. But all these, all these different data structures, the way that we could define how we traverse a set of contiguous uh, uh, address spaces can have meaningful impacts on the amount of time it takes to process a result. So this is going to start motivating us developing a measure system, a metric system to define how optimized is our code base and whether we can create a solution. You could have two different solutions that do the same task, but one could be more efficient based off of the way we define our, our measures. And so when we're talking about crafting well-defined software systems, it's important to understand how we can measure the efficiency of our application. So it's not just about building an application that works, but it's one that, that's, that's, that works, it's designed well, and it's efficient. These are, again, all go into the software design principles that we wanna to try to cover and learn to use over the course of this semester. So again, uh, trying to step through and uh, explain what all these bullet points are so they're not just a collection of words, but you understand what the impact is, what the meaning is, what the end result of what you should know coming out of this class. And so when, I'm, when you see the words here, searching and sorting, searching and sorting are typically very common things you need to do to having a collection of data inside of your application. And many, many applications are, can be defined as a collection of data, right? So knowing 
how you should store that data and how you should access that data, how you should do what can be classically thought of as CRUD operations. So if you're not familiar with CRUD operations, it's, let me add that in here, because that's effectively what we're learn first learning how to do. What CRUD operations are, is being able to create data, read data, update our data, and delete our data. So, and if you think of any kind of real practical application, whether it's a banking application or whether it is a, a, a video game that has like a login system, whether it's like a, a, a sales front page where like, or a, uh, like a, a storefront page, like an online store where you can create an account and be able to add things into your card and do a checkout. Like almost any kind of application that you're using that you actually use on your day-to-day -day life probably manages a collection of data. Very few applications, right, uh, are just a couple of data elements that you process and, and deliver result on. And so, yeah, we're going to really cover how we can how we can make choices on how we're going to store that data so we can process it in an efficient way. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, what you're supposed to get out of this class is you're, you're going to learn how to use Java and the tools built into Java to actually start building real applications. So right now, you know how to build applications, but they're probably not like applications that you would go to the Android store or something that you actually just use on a day-to-day -day basis. Here, by the time you finish this class, I would like for everyone to feel like they could build a real-life application, something that has graphics, something that is networked, something that is multi-threaded, right? Something that makes use of being able to save or import to files, right? So be able to save the state of your, 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 your application and then re recall it. All things that you probably think are common features of an application, you should learn how to do. And I, I, I'd wager to say you don't know how to do that yet, right? Is that a fair assessment? Excellent. And so, and then where we'll leave off, so we'll learn how to use everything built into Java to do that. Where we'll leave off is you'll learn how to make some of these decisions on efficiency and what it means to be optimized. Well, we'll talk about that briefly, but we're not gonna go into that uh, in a very deep uh, uh, way because we wanna save that for data structures. The entire point of data structures is to really learn how to measure the efficiency and optimization of your, of your code. So we'll talk about considerations, just like we talked about the basic concepts of all of this stuff in, in Java 1. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's see. So we, we talked a little bit about like J, basic Java projects, and you probably just used your terminal and you used JDK, which is it, it, it's binded to the, the uh, alias of Java C when you were invoking it. It's, and then you were using uh, the Java uh, runtime environment, which you probably had alias as Java at your command line, right? You probably talked about basic data collections, right? So you learned about arrays and then you, other ways of modeling data was as classes or as interfaces, right? You probably talked about uh, types, so primitive types, reference types, classes, the uh, class object, object-oriented principles where we could start defining our own reference types. You probably had these basic ideas of like, uh, user interfaces. So you built these command prompt interfaces, you system out for that, you system in. Same thing with uh, uh, IO, right? You're probably using your input stream and your system dot out for your output stream, but like you didn't learn how to do file reading and you didn't really learn how to define what a byte stream was inside of Java. And you probably didn't learn how to serialize your data so you can store it outside your application. You didn't learn how to do GUI programming, but you learned how to do command-driven programming, right? You didn't learn um, how to do type parameters, but you learned how to build classes and interfaces, right? You didn't learn how to build your own data structures and container types, but you learned the built-in ones like arrays and maybe looked at array list. You didn't learn the input output operations, but you learned a little bit about how like data is passed between objects by message passing or how we could use scanner to parse a, uh, 
the uh, input stream for data. Uh, you didn't learn about concurrency, but you learned about what uh, sequ the sequential execution of an algorithm. So like there's all these concepts that were introduced in 1583 that we're going to now go into the advanced state of. But at the same time, we're going to start setting the stage for talking about, well, what does it mean to build an efficient application? And then that's what they'll study in 2125. And that'll kind of complete the entirety of your introductory journey into software engineering. So starting from 1583, then progressing from 1583 into 2120, and then from 2120 to 2125. Okay, so again, one of the things I always hated about um, syllabi when I would go through them is they would give you all the course content at bullet points, but then they didn't really map that to uh, learning objectives. So I spent, oh God, like an hour doing that. <laughs> Okay, so again, also, we have a lab that's required where you actually get the ability to work with a lab instructor and have uh, applications of the concepts that we'll cover inside of our lectures. Uh, our grading and, um, and as it stated, I'm just going to use the same rubric that was posited uh, prior to me teaching, but, uh, and I'll stick with this, but I'm not sold on these on these numbers. I, I would probably like to increase the percentages uh, for homework or for, for lab, I think, but that would require a, a lot of refactoring. So we'll stick with this. So 30% of your final grade will come from your homeworks, 30% will come from your lab, and 40% will come from test. And again, this the same way that the test worked in 1583 will work here. So uh, what your final can be counted twice and uh, that which allows you to drop one of the earlier grades or if you do really well on your first two, then it could just be a equal distribution. So, I mean, same rules as what the grading is. I mean, I usually have a different pedagogical approach with my grading anyway. I like to do audit check-ins with students just to see where everyone's at and see how they solve problems. So we'll play this, this part, this grading part by ear a little bit. Uh, we'll see how well that works in a summer uh, semester. Uh, in terms of attendance, this is an internet course. So you don't necessarily have to be here for the live video uh, lectures. I'll make them available through uh, through uh, Moodle, actually, what I'll probably do is I'll, what I had some really good successes last semester, just posting all of my videos onto uh, YouTube and then creating a playlist that has all the videos. And then you can just go ahead and go to my playlist page, or if you subscribe, you can get an alert, I guess, uh, whenever I post a new video. But those will be your options. I, I, I had much better success, I think, with being able to use uh, YouTube for content delivery as opposed to Zoom where you have to use a password and you have to click on an individual link. And it's just, there's so much friction between moving from one video to another with Zoom. Okay. Yeah, and, and our, our expected learning outcomes upon completion will be to be able to identify, discuss, and use object-oriented programming techniques, to be able to identify and use best practices in documenting your computer code, to be able to design software systems with multiple interacting classes, to be able to design a multi-threaded application, to be familiar with Java networking model, to understand and be able to use both linear and tree-based data structures and understand their weaknesses and strengths. I'm not gonna go too deep into the implementation because I think that's what data structures role is. I'd rather have you learn how to build real working applications than go too much into the data structures of things. So this is probably the biggest part where I'll deviate some and be exposed to be able to use uh, some common object oriented design patterns. And again, you really use these patterns when you build either networked applications or event driven GUI applications. So really, I want to try to introduce you to GUIs quicker than I think the traditional 2120 class, because I would like for you to do some homework assignments that both make use of JUnit testing and that make use of uh, graphic user interfaces. So I will warn you, 
I will probably fall out of sync with the lap, but don't let that stress you out. So it might be possible that your first introductory, your, your first introduction to some concepts might be in the lab before the lecture, or the lecture might cover concepts well before the lab ever reaches it. And that's okay. I'm, I have that expectation and don't feel stressed if you feel kind of out of sequence. If that happens, send me a message on Discord. Oh, by the way, I know I mentioned this, but let me definitely load into the Discord. So again, I would like for all of our class discussion, any questions you might have, don't direct them to me through email, send them to me via uh, uh, the Discord. So let me go here. So here inside of our Discord, there will be a Java 2 uh, channel. So I want everyone to use the invite, if you haven't already done so, to access this Discord server. And I will just put hello class here. You can ask me all, all your questions that you might have over the course of the semester here. And so I have this application both on my phone and my computer. So I do get alerted every time. This is, again, the best way to contact me. In fact, some of you might have already realized that uh, I think I've gotten some emails where I don't, you probably didn't get a response from my email, but when I, you sent the, um, the request through Discord, I, I usually respond almost immediately whenever possible. And if not, know that I, and if you want to tag me, you could do at, uh, at Ted Holmberg, right? And this will allow you to tag and this will, you see how it alerts me here? So this will send an alert to let me know that I had a, a message that was targeted specifically for me. Excellent. So up to this point, is there a, so we're, we're finally done, or well, kind of done. Here, I have a tentative schedule. This tentative schedule of, uh, is based off of the prior one, just to give us some structure. But again, this is uh, tentative. I, I'm likely to break free of this uh, entirely. So here, this is, so our first week, I think is still going to be relatively correct. Uh, we'll talk about uh, inheritance and polymorphism, Java docs, programming by contract, unit testing, uh, unit testing versus functional testing, uh, and then we'll introduce J units. So yeah, this I think is where we want to start. This all makes sense. Uh, let's see here. You see, this doesn't make sense to me. I wouldn't introduce recursion until I enter. This is a weird place to introduce recursion. So, so you might get a recursion lab. I was just talk to the lab instructor and have them move this because it doesn't make sense to teach recursion at this level. Uh, then yeah. This might make sense. Gen, uh, list collections. Yeah, I, I could see myself following that. But in this, I don't know if I want to spend that much time. I, I wouldn't jump into GUIs then. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna mix and match based off what I think is higher priority. Because when I look at this, I see a lot of things that just overlap with data structures. So there's other things that I think are higher priority. Since I know you're gonna get exposure to that in 2125. Is there any questions that anyone has for me? I feel like I've just been uh, drooling on now for the last uh, hour or so, talking about my learning objectives. Okay, well, the next thing I want to do then is I want to, uh, well, based off of what I have tentative for today, right, uh, based off of the tentative schedule, was the concept of inheritance and polymorphism. So I, this is where I actually want to touch base. I have 10 minutes, about 10 minutes left. I want to touch base with everyone in the class and find out, well, like, where are you with object-oriented design? Like, let me, let me see. Supposedly, there's ways to do polls and stuff in here, but I'd rather just ask the that's only 14 people. This isn't huge, right? So I'm going to ask everyone. Is everyone comfortable with the, with the concept of a class, with what the class keyword does? Okay, perfect. Is everyone comfortable with what the distinction between a concrete class and an abstract class is. Actually, I do want to play around with doing polls. 
Okay. There's so many options on here. Oh, here, poll. C8. Oh my God, this is too too much work. It's lost me. It was, oh, okay, okay. So, so let's open this dialogue up a little bit. And uh, I mean, we only have ten minutes left, so it might be quicker if you want to like put your microphone on. I'm fine with that. So just to ex expedite things. Um, but let me lay down a couple of um, a couple of things that I would like to set as a base case and just make sure everyone's on the same pace. And it's going to be in this unit three object oriented design. So uh, we we learned a little bit about when we started it for, when we first started learning objects using 1583. We learned the class keyword. And we learned what the class keyword allows us to do, right, is, well, when we first learned classes, we learned that that's how we group our collection of methods but and, and fields. Did, was the word field used at all, by the way? So another word for fields that you probably used it is, uh, is uh, as a variable, like as a class variable or as an instance variable. Now, another name for that a more generic name for that is a field. If you if you haven't learned that terminology yet, so a class is a collection of fields and methods. And so when you first started looking at classes, you probably just looked at static methods, right? So you had a class that contained static methods. The first static method you ever learned to write that everyone learns to write is uh, is the main method, right? The main method has to be static. And so again. What the keyword static does when it's applied to a method or to a field means it becomes a property of the class itself and not an instance. The default behavior without the static keyword is that everything is uh, a property of an instance of a class. So you have to explicitly make it a property of the class itself, right? And does that distinction between a class field and an instance field make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. And the common approach, so one great thing about class fields and class methods is that they can be accessed from the class itself. You don't have to build an instance from it. Now, the disadvantage of it is not a disadvantage, a difference between that and an instance field or an instance uh, uh, method is that it has one value for the entirety of the class. So it can't have multiple varying values at a given time. Okay, so that's the that's that's uh, the static keyword when it's applied. Now, an abstract class versus a concrete class. A concrete class means that it's a well-defined class. A well-defined class means that all of its methods are implemented. It means that they're not just declared, but they have a defined meaning. So if it's concrete, it means that I can actually instantiate it. So one of the interesting things about classes, besides just having the fact that they can have static methods and static fields or instance methods and instance fields is the ability to actually instantiate them. You have to have a constructor to instantiate them. You don't necessarily have to define a constructor because if you don't define one, a default constructor is defined for you. However, if there are certain properties you want to define with inside of your class, you have to define a constructor. You can even overload your constructor so that you can have more than one constructor. Okay, so constructors are used to instantiate classes. A concrete class is a class where all of its methods are well-defined, which means it's implemented. So an abstract class is a method where, is a class where at least one method is not well-defined or is abstract. And so essentially an abstract class cannot be instantiated on its own. It relies on a concrete class, a subclass to come behind it and to inherit it and to take one of its abstract methods and to define what its behaviors are. So, okay, after just redefining what abstract classes are, where's everyone's concept in terms of interfaces? What does everyone, is everyone confident about what the distinction between an interface and a public uh, and an abstract class is?
That's right. So, so an interface is nothing but abstract methods. And so the motivation behind an interface versus an abstract class, because there's a design choice there. If there is some shared data between two classes, you always try to adhere to what's called the dry principle. So instead of repeating yourself across multiple classes, if there's any shared data, you can abstract that away and have those two concrete classes inherit from an abstract class where the common, the, the overlapping um, uh, code, so the overlapping behaviors and the overlapping fields are then defined in the abstract class. But the idea is that there's some kind of overlapping uh, 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 data there. There's some kind of overlapping sharing there. The distinction between that and an interface is that an interface, you might still have to be able to group those things together in terms of polymorphic behavior, but there's no shared, there's no shared data between them and there's no shared common methods. But, but interfaces allow us to have the most flexibility in defining what that thing is. So one nice thing about interfaces is that we can, we can implement as many interfaces as, as we want, but we can only extend one class. So Java is uh, its single inheritance, but it allows for any number of interfaces. So interfaces is a very powerful mechanism to go ahead and define the most abstract part of your polymorphic inheritance-based object-oriented software system. And so did you actually design any code that made use of interfaces and abstract classes and concrete classes? Okay, so over the course of this semester, we'll make use of interfaces, abstract classes. And so you might know it on a concept level, on a concept level, on a conceptual level, but not necessarily an applicable level. Okay, so what we'll do here is what we'll do over the course of this week is just make sure everyone feels super confident and comfortable with this concept of inheritance. Uh, uh, the difference between composition and, and inheritance. Uh, was that covered? Uh, the has a versus a, is a relationship and how you could distinguish one versus the other. Okay, that's good. And does anyone at least everyone does is anyone uncomfortable with the concept of polymorphism and what it allows us to do did everyone do the platformer game by chance okay good yeah the platformer game i think is a great example of illustrating what the advantage of a polymorphic system is because it shows you how you can have multiple concrete instances of like tiles or whatnot and they can all be different things but you group them together so that you can get you you can iterate across them to see if the player is dead or not yeah so i i think that's a good kind of primer to illustrate how polymorphisms used to build software design systems and so we're going to continue kind of that that approach excellent well i i kind of run have run out of time for our first lecture is there any questions that anyone has uh before we kind of end our session Excellent. So as, as we continue to, how will the homeworks be structured? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I, so I'm the one who authored the homeworks that are used in 1583, uh, but really it all comes down to time. I, I'm going to prioritize my time. It depends on how I prioritize my time for the semester, whether I want to rework the slides or whether I want to rework the homework but I only have so much time. And since lectures happen like every day, I'm going to try, I would like to have homeworks that are more congruent to the homeworks in 1583. But if I don't have time to refactor them, then they will be whatever the pre-existing homeworks were. So we'll see.
Uh, so I don't have quite an answer for you because I'm quite literally uh, potentially rewriting this course as I'm teaching it. The only problem with me doing that for a summer course is that it moves at 2x speed. Yeah, you can PM me on Discord. So you can either send me a message. I, I prefer um, questions inside of the uh, channel, the 2120 channel, because it allows for everyone else to be a part of that discussion. But if it's something that's uh, like a, a personal request, you can just send me a uh, PM. Excellent. Is there any other questions? Well, I will see everyone tomorrow. Have a have a great day.